Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming along to this. Um, this final session of the evening before the quiz is about, it's titled Why Endocrinology and Diabetes? And what the society was interested in was where do we get the next generation of endocrinologists and diabetologists from? So we wanted to hear some, um, the, um, some stories from some people who've been through that already. It might seem a strange, uh, a strange location to have this talk to an audience of endocrinologists. One of the things that we were hoping for was that not just in the audience will be people who haven't fully differentiated into endocrinologists yet. We just find out who they are. And perhaps if you put your hands up, so we have. No, no. We don't. So keep your hands up if you're if you're a F1 or F2. Okay, it's a small number there. Okay, CT1. CT2. Okay, so CT2s are and close to be thinking about it. Even younger than that? Okay, CT3. I count it as CT2, actually, but yes, okay. There we are. So we quite like to... And medical students? Oh. Great, okay. Any group of... Anyone above C... Anyone who's already a registrar in endocrinology or a consultant? <laughs> <laughs> So this is, this is perfect. This is exactly what we're after. So there are a group of people who we want to turn into endocrinologists by um, about 8.40. And another group of people who we want to be able to go off back to their hospitals and to turn everyone else into endocrinologists. So we'd like to leave you with some ideas on how to do that when you go back to work. Um, so I'd like to invite our first speaker um, from Sheffield, Professor John Neil Price. So, thank you for that. Um, I walk around this meeting, I've been coming to this meeting for a long time, and I feel increasingly like an old fart, because I don't recognise people, and having been asked to give this talk, thank you, Chair, I now feel like a real old fart. <laughs> so, um, I, I didn't know quite where to pitch this, and I didn't know what the demographic of the audience uh, will be, so I hope that it's going to be brief, because I think it'd be more interesting to have the panel discussion than, than me um, droning on for too long. These are my uh, disclosures, uh, which don't affect this talk, but they are nevertheless my disclosures. So, people who are not differentiated, endocrinology is truly fascinating. If you've attended today, you would have seen the incredible variety that you can... Uh, be exposed to by coming involved with endocrine practice and science. I mean, you just see, the, the, we've just had this debate on thyroxine, we've had Rob Semple give talk, we've had other people give talks, uh, you've seen Gordon Hager give talk about chromatin, and it's the interplay between the science and practice that makes endocrinology a truly, truly fascinating subject. And if you're interested in precision, this is the subject for you, because you get the opportunity to make very accurate diagnoses, to tailor the particular treatments you have, and actually then integrate all of that with a variety of biochemical tests, clinical assessment, imaging, and a discussion with a wide variety of different specialties, and I'm going to come on to that in uh, some of the talk. But it isn't all science. There's a great art, and sometimes I think we forget the art. There's the art to listening to and talking to people and making sure that what you're doing is actually taking the patient's interest to heart and making sure that they're getting the appropriate treatment. The pace of development in endocrinology is truly incredible. New developments all the time. If you went to the talk on the genetics of adrenal disease this morning, you would have seen a whole raft of new genetics that are coming online, and that will change and transform our practice, and already has done. And the SFE is a great place to collaborate and interact with other people. And I show a picture of the globe there because the SFE is global, but the other organizations, such as the European Society and the American Endocrine Society, they are really international societies. So they are recognizing that by getting international speakers at all their meetings uh, and are very much taking that membership to their very heart. So, a career in endocrinology. So, this is just some general comments. So, this is the sort of nonsense that you see written down, and you'll see from your 
FY1, core medical training, you've got this sort of line that's drawn through like that. And of course, it's not that, it's this, isn't it? That's really what you're up against in your career because you start at the beginning, you wander around, and sometime at some odd place down in the distant future, you are, by whatever measure, successful. And that's a difficult path because usually most of us are still buried around here somewhere. So those are generic things. I've got to talk about what I did, because that's what I've been asked to do. So I did my house jobs for a year. I did two years as a senior house officer. I then became a lecturer uh, for a couple of years. I then in the Medical Research Council Training Fellowship, did a PhD, a couple more years as a lecturer, and I've been a consultant for 15 years. And I'm a clinical academic, so that all sounds fine and dandy. I'll come back to it, because it's not quite so fine and dandy. So what do I do now? Well, I've got a really busy clinical practice, which I am very, very uh, keen to continue, uh, and really quite proud of what we have in Sheffield. I'm the lead for endocrinology in Sheffield. I head up the pituitary and the neuroendocrine tumor regional services. We've done an awful lot to develop that service, and I'll, I'll show that in a slide or so. And it's been an amazing uh, experience because it has been an opportunity to actually impact not just locally, but also nationally and internationally. So on local levels, we've developed uh, a lot of different services uh, and hopefully interacted with patient groups and forwarded the uh, various uh, opportunities that we have to be able to treat these people. Nationally, uh, I chair uh, the Endocrinology and Diabetes Clinic uh, committee at the Royal College of Physicians, so we interact with the College of Physicians and the SFE is represented on that. And internationally, I've sat on two of the American Endocrine Society guidelines for treatment, and I'm currently on one of the European guidelines for treatment of uh, Cushing's and adrenal disease. So that's great fun. It's really important because the impact that that has on patient care is enormous because these guidelines are taken and used in everyday clinical practice. One of the things which uh, I am going to show again in another slide is the importance of patient groups. So I'm a trustee on the Pituitary Foundation, and that's uh, been a very important uh, role. It's something which um, means you actually interact and listen to what the patients are actually telling you. And I think in endocrinology, as much as any specialty I've come across, there are all these incredibly active patient groups which you have the ability to interact with and actually make a difference. Clearly, as an academic, I'm involved in research and teaching, and so that's both basic science and clinical science. Uh, I'm involved in writing both journals and textbooks, and I'm the, one of the senior editors of uh, clinical endocrinology. Now, this is not a linear path. This was a load of nonsense. I couldn't get a SHO job. I sent off, I don't know, 15, 16 different applications, couldn't get a job. Um, eventually, I got one six-month post and took a risk that would be okay, and then on the strength of that, they managed to get three more jobs, all at different hospitals. In terms of this lecturer, this was a job that Michael Besser at Barts, who I was incredibly indebted to in terms of the training, said that, well, I've got this job, why don't you come and do it? So it was a risk to take that, because it was just initially for one year, uh, and then it rolled out for a couple of years. And on the strength of that, it then allowed me to get some data together for a fellowship application. And then coming forward to after that, to do two years later, I was then in the position where Tony Wheatman, who's just been in the debate just now, phoned me up when I was at Bart saying, would you think about coming to work in Sheffield? So it was a risk, but actually it's been a risk that's been well worthwhile and has really uh, paid dividends. So one of the things I'm going to uh, suggest to you is you need a mentor. And if you haven't got one, make sure you select one well. You do not want the mentor who treats you like this, because although that's important, you really want someone who's going to listen to you. So I had some great mentors at Bart, Mike Besser, Ashley Grossman, John Walsh, Adrian Clark, and they were very, very formative, or rather, my time with them was very, very formative. So one of the first take-home messages I would say is get a mentor and make sure you explain to them what your wishes are and make sure that they are the type of person who's going to foster your overall development. Second of five messages, listen to your patients. So the thing about endocrinology, as much as anywhere, is in the clinics. That's where our specialty is based. Very little inpatient work, at least in our practice in Sheffield. Most of it's in clinics. So if you're nosy and you like listening to people, great specialty. So if you're nosy and you want to hear what's wrong with people, you just sit there and let them tell you what's wrong with them. It's brilliant. 
And once you do that, and then you integrate that with a few tests, then you go away and you can actually make a difference. And then you get people in other specialties thinking you're really clever. It's surprising, but that's actually what people think. And the charities and patient groups are really important. There's a whole raft of them who attend these meetings, go and visit their stands, go and talk to them, go and find out actually what's bothering them. And it's often completely different to what you think is important. Next message, this is a generic message, and it's one of taking some risk, being resilient, and being flexible. So those of you who are not differentiated, you may have to move. You may have to move to a place which is good for your training if you want to be in endocrinology. You may have to change. And then those of you who are consultants, of course, you may have to be resilient and to that change in both the NHS or in the universities if you're there. And of course, you can drive the change and make differences in terms of patient care. And the job I'm currently doing is completely unrecognizable compared to the job that I took up some 15 years ago as a differentiated consultant. So it doesn't stop. It does change, and you can make the changes. So it's important not to just assume that you become a consultant, and then that's it. So all I do is I interact with these guys. So these are the people who I see every single week in my clinics, in our multidisciplinary team clinics, and in our multidisciplinary team meetings. So the only way you can practice endocrinology to its logical conclusion is in big centers. So if you are interested in doing that, then of course you want to try and make sure you're working in big centers and you need all these people. I couldn't possibly do all the stuff we do without all these people. But clearly, you don't have to be working in a big center to be practicing endocrinology, but if you're faced with conditions which require these type of people, that's where the people need to go to. But the teamwork and the people you work with is of course vital. And finally, just to push for academia. So if you're not differentiated in endocrinology, it's a great subject to go into, but consider all the research and the teaching you can do. Uh, I've had the privilege of actually uh, chairing the Society for Endocrinology Clinical Update for three years. So that's teaching the next generation, which was fantastic. Uh, and then, of course, there is the fact that as you go forward, if you get into academia, you yourself can be the mentor. And, of course, in terms of the type of activity you can do, you have the opportunity to give your research and teaching on an international level, which not only is interesting, it brings new practice back to the UK. So I think I'll finish there.